experience the power. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. And John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God is good, and all the time, let's say it, with some energy, God is good, all the time. and all the time. How are you, my friends? I'm delighted to see you. I always am. I'm tempted to ask you, why do you come night after night? But I won't. I will just assume you come because you love, thus saith the Lord. Am I right? All right. For those of you online, thank you very much for joining us. I wish I knew precisely where you are as you listen to this presentation, but God knows where you are. God sees you. Thank you very much for connecting, and may the Lord bless you abundantly for loving the truth. I particularly welcome all our guests, those of you who are not Seventh-day Adventists, whether in this building or online. Thank you very much for investing some of your time into this program. And may the Lord bless you and reward you for making time for his word. I like to welcome always my little brothers and little sisters who are watching or who are present in this congregation or this gathering. My little brothers, my little sisters, thank you so much for loving Jesus who was once a little boy just the way you are. Now for those of you in this building, if you are not a Seventh-day Adventist, you are here for the very first time. May I see your hand? First time. Ah, all right. Okay, first time. All right, good. Those of you who have come again and again and again, and you are not Seventh-day Adventists, may I see your hands? All right. For those of you online, thank you very much. Let me pray for those guests, those who are not Seventh-day Adventists. Our Father in heaven, I come to you because you are the treasure of blessings, the treasure house of goodness, the treasure house of grace. Thank you, dear God, for your Holy Spirit who brought our guests online and in this building. Now, Father, I ask you to bless them as they listen, enlighten their understanding. And Father, I ask you to beat back the forces of evil from their lives. Deliver them from harassment from the enemy, day God, that they may walk freely, walk uprightly. Put a double blessing on their children, day God, and let their homes, wherever they live, be places of safety and security, places of plenty. In Jesus' name I pray, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. How are you? Good, so am I. I have no complaints at all. As they say in Swahili, hakuna matata. No complaint, sinashida. Now I have one question. I don't need to get to the phone. What is so important about the law? Didn't Jesus in his death take care of the law and we no longer have to keep the law? That question can take many, many evenings to deal with completely. It is one of the central issues in the Bible. Let me pray. Father, I have come to speak for you. I ask you now, Father, help me to do that to your satisfaction. Put your thoughts in my mind, your words in my mouth. 
the humility of Christ in my heart along with boldness. Suppress my carnal nature, God. Let your glory be my only business. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What's so important about the law? Let us go to Romans chapter 3. Now let's answer this one question, then get to the message. Romans chapter 3, we shall read verse 20. Romans 3, verse 20, the sooner you find it, the sooner I can get through and get to the message. When you found it, let me know. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Finish the verse. For by the law, come on, is the knowledge of sin. Let me say that differently. Remove the law and no one will know what is sin. Remove the law and sin will cease to exist. By the law is the knowledge of sin if it is still up on that screen. Now, let us go to Romans chapter 4. We'll read verse 15. We're answering the question, what is so important about the law? And did not Jesus by his death fulfill the law and we no longer have to obey it? Romans 4 verse 15. Because the law worketh wrath. For where the no law is, there is no transgression. It's virtually the same thing as Romans 3.20. Where no law is, there is no transgression. In other words, for something to be morally wrong, there must be a law. You don't have to be a Christian. Every country has laws. Are you with me? Every country has laws. On the basis of those laws broken, people end up in prison or on the gallows. Romans 5. Let's read 12 and 13 of Romans 5. How is my speed? Not too bad? All right. God bless my sister as she does the work of God. Romans 5 verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. For until the law, or before the law was given on Sinai, sin was in the world. Finish the verse. But sin is not imputed. Come on. When there's no law. Romans 3 verse 20, no law, no sin. Romans 4 verse 15, no law, no sin. Romans 5 verse 13, no law, no sin. Romans 7. Let's read verse 7. By the way, it is the devil who wants you to believe there's no law. He wants you to think you can do whatever you like and God is pleased. That's what he wants you to think because a life like that qualifies you expertly for hell. Romans 7 verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, read with me, but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said. Thou shalt not covet. Now, thou shalt not covet comes from which law? The Ten Commandments. Which one is it? Number ten. Mm -hmm. Paul is saying, the only way I knew that lusting is wrong is because the law said, thou shalt not covet. Go to Matthew 5. I find it very astonishing that the Bible has such plain words. And people still go the opposite direction. It astonishes me. What book did I say? Matthew. What chapter? Five. Let's read from verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Two opposite words. Destroy means get rid of it. Fulfill means make it very, very clear. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Let's read that again. For verily I say unto you, read with me now, till heaven and earth pass. Stop. Wait, wait, stop, stop. Thank you for being eager. Will God destroy this sinful heaven and this sinful earth? Yes, it will pass away. 
But does the Bible say he'll make a new heaven and a new earth? So the heaven and the earth will never pass away in that sense. There will always be a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus says, till heaven and earth pass, which will never happen, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called what? The least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Let me pause. Are you trying to encourage someone not to keep the Sabbath? The Bible says, whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, never tell people disobey God. That person is the least, when they say in the kingdom of heaven, it doesn't mean he's in the kingdom and he's the least. Those in the kingdom will look at him and regard him as the least of all humanity. But whosoever shall do and teach them. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Tell people to obey God and you obey yourself. For I say unto you, verse 20, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the, scribe, the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now let me pause on that. Jesus said, except your righteousness. What does exceed mean? Go beyond. Above and beyond. Except your righteousness, talking to his disciples, shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. He shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus gives examples as if someone said to him, what do you mean my righteousness must exceed? Christ gives examples to explain what he means. Read verse 21. What does that say? Ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the, yes. Jesus said, have you ever heard you shouldn't kill? Of course, the people might have said yes. And if you kill, you're in danger of the judgment. What Jesus is saying, you've heard, don't physically kill people. Now listen to righteousness that exceeds. Are you with me? But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the counsel. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. What is Christ saying? You've got to raise your sense of righteousness above physical death. Unreasonable anger, a grudge in the eyes of God, is murder. Now, let's go to verse 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever, what? Looketh on a woman, come on, to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, for the Pharisees, you had to do it physically. Are you with me? Also in any country. Because no government can know you're lusting. Are you following me? Jesus now says, let's go higher in righteousness. Don't even think it. Now, when Christ wanted to explain what he meant by righteousness that exceeds, think with me now, where did he go? To the law. To the law. And he gave two examples. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. He went to the law. Not the ceremonial law. He went to the Ten Commandments because perfect obedience to God is the highest expression of righteousness. Now, the question also contained this item. Why do we have... To, well, Christ fulfilled the law. All right. Let's go to Romans 13. Christ fulfilled the law. We no longer have to, have to keep it. Romans 13. It's already 14 minutes to 5. I'll release you by 5.30 or slightly beyond. I hope you'll stay with me. Romans 13, reading from verse 8. When you found it, say amen. Is it up there? Owe no man anything but to love one another. Now listen to me. Reason with me now. 
Favor number three. Owe no man anything. The only thing we ought to owe people is to what? Love them. When? Only in the days of Christ? When? Now? If we live tomorrow, if we live next week, owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another, finish the verse, hath fulfilled the law. In other words, if you remove the law, love cannot be fulfilled. Look at how verse 8 ends. He that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Something must be present for it to be fulfilled. If there is no law, there is no love. Are you following me? He that, hath, he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Verse 9, for this... Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. What do you understand by briefly comprehended? Summarized. He means the six on the second table. Verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, finish the verse, love is the fulfilling of the law. When? Today. But for something to be fulfilled, it must exist. The devil wants you and me to live a life based on this principle. Do whatever you like. Nothing will get you to hell more quickly than living by that principle, if I can call it a principle. That's why he has gotten into preachers in pulpits to preach. The law has been done away with. And people by the millions believe it. Even though some of their relatives may be in prison for breaking the law. And they, they still believe there's no law. Let me tell you in the presence of a holy God. There's a law. And the brother of Jesus said, so speak ye and so do. As they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. That's one term for the Ten Commandments. James says, you ought to live your life as though you realize that one day you'll be judged by the law that you thought no longer existed. That's it for now. Our subject for today, well done. What did I say? Well done. It's uh, 10 to 5. Of course, you're not using this, turn it off. You've done very well on this point. Let me thank you very much. God bless you. I really mean that. Thank you for your reverence. I have not heard, I, maybe once, and that was accidental, and that person went and sinned no more. And so thank you for this, uh, respecting God. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I, the God of heaven and earth, have put my words in thy mouth. In other words, divine words in human lips. What a privilege. And favor number three, think. What's the verse? Isaiah 1.18, Come now, tell me, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Thank you for watching over us. Today, all over the world, people died. But we are alive. Thank you very much. You've kept us alive not to continue in sin, dear God, but to decide, let me give my life to my Savior. To make a turn. To appreciate your mercy. If we've sinned against you, forgive us. Particularly me. I present myself to you, dear God, to be used by you, to be used by your spirit, to represent Jesus Christ. I ask you, Father, to fill me with truth, fill me with fearlessness, but fill me with compassion. Dear God, bless all those listening. There's someone still fighting you. Somehow let that person know, no one who fights you can ultimately win. 
Father, bless our guests wherever they are. Touch them, embrace them, bless them, dear God. And a sweet blessing on all the little children. For those who are sick, Father, place your healing hand on them even as I pray. Because you've said in Exodus 15, 26, For I am the Lord that he lived thee. Father, I give you no orders. I simply make requests. Bless Nigeria in every possible way. Make Nigeria a shining example, not only on the African continent, but to the world. And a nation can rise no higher than a nation that practices righteousness. Bless every level of administration in this country, dear God. We thank you for the presence of his highness, the king and the queen. Bless them. May they reign long. And may they bless your people as David blessed your people in the Old Testament. Father, wherever people are worshiping you now, bless them, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Let us go to Genesis 15. We shall read from verse 1. Our subject, well done. Time, seven minutes to five. Genesis 15, reading from verse 1. For those of you online, wherever you are, who have been praying for me, thank you very much. You have no idea how badly I need it. And those of you present as well, whoever prays for me, thank you, and may God reward you richly. Genesis 15, reading from verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, unto him, So shall thy seed be. Verse 6. And he believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him, for what? Righteousness. Now, God told Abraham, Your seed will be like the stars that you cannot count. Now, God says something else. In verse 10, in association with a vast seed. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. He tells him you'll have many descendants, even though his wife couldn't have children. He tells him, this land I'll give to you, even though he was a stranger in the land. Verse 8. And he said, Lord God, Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? I've heard what you said, but can you demonstrate to me that I may have peace of mind, that I'll have it? Whereby shall I know? Show me something. Do something. You know, God is a God who loves to do something. He said, oh, taste and see. That the Lord is good. In other words, you try me, I will do something to convince you I am good. We're all familiar with Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now here with saith the Lord of hosts. Prove me, saith God. Put me to the test and I will do something. And so Abraham said in verse 8, Lord God, whereby shall I know? That I shall inherit it. And he said unto them, unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the fowls or the birds divided he not. When the fowls came down on the carcass, carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now God is demonstrating. He is backing up what he said with an interesting uh, ceremony. 
And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a hollow of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety, verse 13, that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for a hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not full. Verse 16, God says, after 400 years, they'll come out. In verse 15 he says, thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. So God is telling Abraham, this is what will happen now. Why does he tell him, cut the heifer, cut the ram, cut the she-goat in two pieces, and leave a path between? What God is telling Abraham, let this be my fate if I cannot keep my word to you. You didn't hear what I said. God is telling Abraham, you see, in the Old Testament, we read about cutting a covenant. That's what it's based on. You cut a covenant as those animals were cut. And we go to verse 17 in a minute. God is saying, may this be my fate if I cannot keep my words to you the words i spoke in verse 5 so shall thy seed be the words i spoke in verse 7 i'll give you this land if i can't keep my word this is how i should end up i god verse 17 and it came to pass that when it was dark when the sun went down and it was dark behold a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Kadmonites, the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. All of that I will give you. But in verse 8, Abraham said, How shall I know? Do something. To convince me that your words I can trust fully. We serve a God who is willing to demonstrate to us that his word is reliable. Now, we serve a God who expects us to do something to show him that our word is reliable. Can you say amen? Because if we're made in God's image, and that's the way God functions, that's the way he wants us to function. And so God says in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, that's what you say. Finish the verse. Keep my commandment. Abraham said, if you really will keep your word and do all these things, do something and show me. There must be an outward display that assures me that I can stand on your word and not stand on shifting sand. And God expects the same of us. If you love me, do something. Now, let us go to Acts 9. Acts 9, our subject, well done. Acts 9, we read from verse 1. I am waiting for you to inform me. That Acts 9 1 is on the screen. Is there? And Saul, yet breathing threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether there were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly, they shine round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, What? Saul, Saul, why persecutest me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Read with me now, Lord, come on, what will thou have me to do? There is always something God wants you to do because there's always something God wants to do for you. You see, God is a God of conditions. God said, you come to me, I'll save you. 
You return the tithe. I'll flood your life with blessings. You confess your sin. I'll forgive you. You eat right. You'll be healthy. Mm -hmm. You obey me. I'll take sickness from you. God is a God of condition. If you do this, I will do that. Now, there is a tremendous imbalance between what we're supposed to do and what God is supposed to do. The imbalance is God always does his part. Can you say amen for God? We, finish my words, almost never do our part. And then whom do we blame? God. God said, if you bring a faithful tithe and offering, I will bless you so much, you'll have to put an extension on your house to put those blessings. And we don't believe it. We don't believe it. And we expect God to bless doubt. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you don't keep the commandments, finish my words, you don't love him. It's as simple as that. You don't love him. And that's also found in the second commandment. And so Paul says, what will thou have me to do? You see, God did something first. He appeared to Paul to save him. For that salvation to be fully carried out, Paul had to do something. What will you have me to do? And then Christ told him, go to the city and someone they will tell you. Because God always has someone on earth who can speak for him. Ah, that amen was weak. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. God has to have an organization on earth that speaks for him. But that organization must say what he says. God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. An organization that says, remember Tuesday is not speaking for God. As plain and simple as that. Now, let's go to Peter in Acts chapter 2. The famous sermon on the day of Pentecost. Let me pray again. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the joy of talking to those whom you love and representing you. At this point, I ask you for more power, more simplicity, more wisdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Acts 2. Peter begins a powerful sermon. Somewhere around verse 14. He pauses in verse 36. In verse 37, the Bible says, this is the congregation now. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. How many of you have come every night so far? Can I see your hand? Every night. You've come every session. All right. Have you been pricked in your heart? Don't answer me. You may have come one night and heard something. Have you been pricked? These people heard one message. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Finish the verse. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission or the removal of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They asked, what shall we do? And Peter told them, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, be baptized. In the very next chapter, Peter is preaching again. We go to chapter 3. We read verse 19. Our subject, well done. The time, 5 after 5. Peter tells another audience, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Again he tells his audience, Repent, be converted, of course, baptism isn't mentioned, but it is implied. It's the same preacher dealing with the same problem. Because repentance must precede baptism. Having seen where God's mighty men called for baptism. Having seen in the passage I read when I walked to the pulpit, where Jesus insisted that his cousin John the Baptist baptize him. And he said, thus it becometh us to fulfill 
all righteousness. The person who says no to baptism is leaving out an act of righteousness. Let me say that again. The person who says no to baptism or rebaptism, if necessary, is leaving out an act of righteousness because Jesus said, by baptizing me, we fulfill, and who's we? The one who's baptized and the one who does the baptizing both fulfill an act of righteousness. Let's take a look at baptism. Go with me to Romans 6. Take a close look at baptism. It is not a bath. Not a shower. Romans 3. No, not 3, sorry, 6. We read from verse 1. You have Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What are the next two words? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not? That so many of us, read with me now, as we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his. Ah, now, listen to me. Why did Christ die? To pay the penalty for sin. Christ died to pay the penalty for sin. Paul says, anyone who is baptized is baptized into that death. As Christ died for sin, we must die to sin. We can't die for sin because we're not a savior. Let me say it again. Someone told me when you're quiet, you're listening, you're thinking. So I, I finally learned my lesson. I will not bother you now. Jesus died, what? For sin. You and I must die to sin. And so Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us, as we're baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. Verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. When you go down, that symbolizes the burial of a dead person. A person dead to sin. When I say dead to sin, not dead to mistakes. A person dead to sin as a ruling power in the life. Sin no longer rules the life. Sin no longer reigns. That is what dies. The reign, the rule, the supervision, the management of sin. It dies. Because anyone and everyone makes mistakes. We've, we've put on, we've died. We've entered into the death of Christ. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, the person goes down. You see, before you baptize, you have to die. Are you with me? Before you go down, you must die. You don't bury a living person. And so before being baptized, you, and those of you who will be tomorrow, you've already made a decision. I want to do what's right. I hate sin. I hate the devil. I love God. You've died to the reign of sin in your life. Now, because you're dead, we can bury you. But we know there's a resurrection. Do we not? Yes. When you come up, that's a little symbolic resurrection. And we know in the resurrection to come, the righteous dead will come up, how? Incorruptible, immortal, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. When you come up out of that water, symbolically you're saying, I look forward to the day when I will come up incorruptible and immortal. Can you say amen? And so you go down, dead to sin. You're a dead person, you're buried. Water is all, and so you come up, you're symbolizing that resurrection to come. Read verse 5 and see the parallel between your baptism and Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, finish the verse, we shall be also in the likeness of his. Mm -hmm. If you die the way he died, you must rise the way he rose. Mm -hmm. If we have been planted, Christ died entirely for sin. You and I must die entirely 
to sin. Then we can rise as Christ rose. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 5. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, finish 6, you should not what? Serve sin. You see, what the power of Christ breaks is the reign of sin in your life. There are two masters, Christ and Satan. When you give your life to Christ, he becomes your master. His righteousness reigns. The Holy Ghost reigns. Can you make a mistake? Yes, you're still a child of God. Because a mistake is not a lifestyle. Come on, somebody say amen. A mistake is not a lifestyle. When sin becomes a lifestyle, the Holy Ghost no longer reigns. Sin reigns. Conversion is the process whereby the rulership of sin is broken. The kingship of sin in your life is broken. In other words, sin is dethroned. Christ carries out a coup. You know what a coup is? Mm -hmm. Overthrow sin and he sits on the throne of your heart. Can you say amen? This is all symbolized by baptism. I die. I surrender to Christ. And I've called for this all the time. I am buried very briefly. And I come up to walk, according to verse 4, in newness of life. Baptism. Let's look at Christ's baptism and learn some lessons. Ooh, it's already 13 after 5. Let's go back to Matthew uh, 3. We read verse 16. Matthew 3, verse 16. Well, before we read Matthew 3, 16, let's go to Acts 2, read verse 38. There's a false teaching I want to deal with. It won't take long. It is dealt with so easily to anyone who's reasonable and honest. And you look that way. Do you have Acts 2? We read 37, 38. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of his apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, what? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Stop. We won't finish the verse. What did Peter tell them to do? Repent. Now, a little child, a baby, cannot repent. Because to repent, you must have a knowledge of sin. Are you with me? Repentance is a turning away from sin. So repentance includes or presupposes confession. You confess your wrong. And you turn from it. A baby cannot do that. So if someone listening to me has been sprinkled. What's the fancy word for that? Christened. You were not baptized. Christ was baptized not as a baby. As someone who knew right from wrong. Anyone who chooses to be baptized must know right from wrong and be able to say I am sorry for this or that I don't want to do it anymore that's confession and repentance baptism requires confession and repentance if you've been christened as I was many years ago before I knew the light I was christened as a baby I had no knowledge of it because I was small let's look at something else about the baptism of Christ that overthrows Christening as a practice that God approves. Verse 16 of Matthew 3. And Jesus, when he was baptized, read the few words now for me, went up straight away, come on, out of the water. Then where was he? To come out of the water, you first had to be where? In the water. Then to baptize someone, you need what? A lot of water. Christ was in the water. The word baptize means to immerse, to dip. The, old, uh, the New Testament Bible writers, they took the word from the secular society. They were merchants or tradesmen, persons, who their trade was making cloths of different colors. They would dye. To change the cloth from white to maybe red, they would dip it completely in a red solution, and it comes up red. That was called baptizing. It had nothing to do with religion. 
then the church writers took it to try to explain this new practice of dipping people and they used the word baptizo which is to dip or immerse that is why there must be enough water for the person to be dipped or immersed it is as simple as abc and the bible says jesus came up out of the water why because he was in the water baptized by his cousin john then he came up now and lo, the heavens were opened unto him we're finishing verse 16 and he saw the spirit of god descending like a dove and lighting upon him now read 17 with me and lo a voice from heaven saying what this is my beloved son in whom i am well please now someone think say it differently this is my beloved son this is my beloved son think of the title this is my beloved son well done well done God is only pleased when something is well done. God expressed confidence, approval, approbation of Jesus Christ when he came up out of the water. Now, Christ is my representative. And anyone in Christ is baptized. The Father says, finish my words, the same thing. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter, not my beloved friend. My beloved son, my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Why? Because the Bible tells us God loves the obedient disciple as much as he loves Jesus. So he can call that man who will be baptized tomorrow, my beloved son, as verily as he called Christ. Or that woman, my beloved daughter. Now you're wondering, where does the Bible teach that? Go to John 17. John 17. We have John 17. Let's read from 22 onward. Are you there? And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as I am one. Read with me. I in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may what? Know that thou hast sent me. You finish the verse. And has love. How? Yes. Mm -hmm. Listen again. The person who obeys God. God loves that person as much as he loves Jesus. And nobody said amen. <laughs> I thought on the last day you'd have mercy on me. God loves the obedient person. How? Come on, tell me loudly. As much as he loves Jesus Christ. Who said, let there be light? Who said, I am the resurrection and the life? Who said, I and my father are one? God loves you when you obey as much as he loves Jesus. Go to verse 26 of John 17. Are you there? But is it up there? Verse 26. Is there now? Read with me. And I have declared unto them thy name. And will declare it carefully now. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me. Read on. Maybe in them. And I in them. Yes. The love you have for me. Must be the love you have for them. This is astonishing. Because some parents love some children more than others. Don't raise your hands. More than others. We all have favorites. That's my favorite son, but you don't let the others know because there will be civil war. God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. What's the condition? Give me one word. Obedience. What's our subject? When you obey God and God looks at you, what does he say? When you conduct your romance in a way that pleases God, God looks down and says, well done. When you eat according to the health laws of the Bible, God looks at you and says what? Well done. When you decide to keep the seventh day Sabbath according to God's word, God looks at you and says, well done. 
When you keep Sunday as a holy day or Tuesday, God looks at you and says, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. I want to say well done, but I cannot. Because I never say well done to disobedience. And so tonight, God wants to say to you what? Well done. I have stood before you for two weeks. We learn tomorrow. I have no clue what God will say to me. Now, as a human being, I hope he'll say, eh, okay, well done, okay, okay, okay. I'll take that. Are you following me? But I want him to say to you with the voice of thunder, come on, tell me, well done. When you come out of that water tomorrow and all the angels are watching and they look at God as God looks at you and God says, well done. And God looks at those of you still resisting and he tells you, I want to say well done. Give me a reason. Give me a reason. What's that reason? Come on, quickly. Starts with an O. Obedience. Go to Genesis 22 quickly. Genesis 22, then I'll close with a call. I told you I'm making a call. Genesis 22. In that chapter, God told Abraham, sacrifice Isaac for a burnt offering. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he did all that needed to be done. Verse 9. And he came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order on the altar. And Abraham bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said what? Abraham, Abraham. And he said what? Here I am. And he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad. Neither do thou anything unto him. Read the next few words. For now I know. Thou fearest me, or you're willing to do whatever I say. God said, now I know. Why? Because Abraham did this, 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 and that. Put all of that together. You have one word. Tell me what it is. Obedience. God said, now I know. But when you say you love me, you're serious. Now I know when you say hallelujah, it comes from here. When you say praise the Lord, it means something to me. Now I know. Because I've seen what you've done. God wants to say two things. They're related. Now I know. And for some of you, he still doesn't know. You can't leave this building with God saying, I don't know about him. He has shown me nothing. I don't know about her. She has shown me nothing. God says to the angels, I am dying to say to that young man, well done. I am dying to say to that young lady, well done. But I cannot say it until they obey as Jesus obeyed. My brothers and sisters, whenever I ask people, how many of you love God? Every hand goes up. Wherever I go. And God says, if you love me, come on, tell me. Put that in one word. If you love me, obey me. Jesus died a terrible death because he loves you. Can you suffer a little inconvenience for him by obeying him? Obedience must not be based on convenience. It must be based on thus saith the Lord. Are you with me? Not convenience because Calvary was not convenient. The Garden of Gethsemane was not convenient. And yet Christ went through it that you may experience the convenience of salvation. Christ became poor that you and I may enjoy the riches of his grace. Christ suffered death, the second death, that you and I may have a place in his kingdom when he comes. How many of you would like God to say to you seriously, well done. Can I see your hands? Well done. Do you mean that? Stand with me. Well done. That's what you tell your child when he finishes graduate school with a bachelor's or master's or whatever. Well done. There's a God in heaven 
who wants to say, well done. And I believe you want to hear him say, well done. And tonight is as good a night as any for God to say to you, well done. Let me tell you this. God will say, well done tonight, even before you get into the water to be baptized. Because it begins right here. Can you say amen? He'll say tonight, and then he'll say tomorrow. Well done. Let me make this call. Let me pray first. Father, this is the final evening. Tomorrow everything ends. But Father, do not close the door of mercy. Let your spirit continue to plead, and I use the word plead, and beg, and implore, and prod, and lovingly push without forcing. That someone finally will say, I want to obey God's commandments, including the fourth commandment. And I want to be baptized. Father, I'll make the final evening call as people are praying in this building and all over the world who are watching. They're praying that hearts will be softened. First, I'll call all those of you who've already made a decision to be baptized. You've already made that decision I have all your names here. Come. You've already made a decision. Come. Let everyone see you. Then I'll make another call. You've already made a decision. Come, come, come. I know you take a long time to come, but come. You've already decided. Come, come, come. Stand right here. God bless you. First one to move. Come, come, come. God bless you. My leaders, join them as they come. You've already made the decision. Come, come, come. You're hearing my voice, but it's your Savior calling you. You've already made a decision. Come. Come, come. Then we'll tell you what you need to know for tomorrow, but we'll tell you back here. You've already made that decision. Come, come. Now, let me make it easy for you. Those of you who have not yet made the decision, but you'll make it now, come with them so no one knows what you are doing. You haven't made it, you'll make it now. Come with those who've already decided. Come. Let God say to you, well done. Slip out and come join this group. You've already made a decision and you're making it now. Come. Come, 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 come. You're deciding tonight. Join this group. By faith, I accept you as belonging fully to this group. Come. You're joining this group. I am making a decision tonight. I want God to say, well done. Well done. Well done. Uh, and God wants to say, come, come, come. Uh, God's people coming. The 11th hour is still an hour of opportunity to decide to do what's right in God's sight. Come, come, come. Those of you on this side, come as they're coming like a river on that side. Come. Father, finally, after listening to this man for two weeks, I'm finally decided to stop resisting the truth. Here I am. Come. Decided to be baptized, obey God, and keep his ten commandments, including commandment four. Come. God bless you. God bless you. Do not be afraid. Come. Come, 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 come. Somebody else. Those of you online, you come. In whatever way you can, where you are, let the leaders know you may be part of a group. I have decided to be baptized. I want God to say to me, well done. You come as well as the Spirit moves you gently. To make that decision which is a life and death decision i want to be baptized i want to obey my god i want god to say well done not only when i'm baptized but every day of my life when i put my head on that pillow i want to hear him say my son my daughter i looked at your day and i say well done because one day christ will come and then there will be a universal well done when the righteous dead shall rise can you say amen but we want that individual well done now. Well done, my son, my daughter. I'll give you 60 seconds and I pray and take them with me to the back. 60 seconds. Someone else come. Father, I'm finally deciding to make that decision that you have always wanted. The decision that will put joy in your heart. Come. I want to be baptized. I want to obey God, not man. Acts 5, 29, the apostles told the Sanhedrin, we ought to obey God rather than man. The seventh-day Sabbath, a commandment of God, 
Sunday, a commandment of man. We ought to obey God rather than man. It's a life-saving decision. 30 seconds. Come. The final evening. Come. Come. God bless you. God bless you. The final evening. Come and make that decision. Come. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. 20 seconds. God bless you. God bless you, sister. God bless you. Keep making your decisions online wherever you are. Whether you're in Nigeria or Kenya or New Zealand, wherever you are, make that decision to be baptized that God may say to you, well done. 15 seconds. Somebody else. Crown it off. 15 seconds. Let me say this. When I take my friends back to this room, feel free to come then if you're that shy. 10 seconds. Come. Christ was baptized. Christ said, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments. Not Constantine's commandments, not the Catholic Church's commandments, my Father's commandments. I kept them and I abide in his love. Someone else is coming. I was just about to pray. God bless you. God bless you. I really mean that. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Come. Is the right thing to do. While I'm praying, you come under the covering of the prayer. In this building and online. Holy Father in heaven, there are two forces at work right now. The Holy Spirit telling people, go. The devil telling them, wait. He's so crafty, he won't say no. he simply say wait because he knows that wait is deadly. Father, let the Spirit's voice overpower his voice, dear God. There's someone you want to say, daughter, well done. Son, well done. Will that person leave his or her seat and come even as I pray? As the Spirit speaks to you, as your heart beats quickly, as your mouth goes dry with nervousness, come. All of that is a sign that the Spirit of God is wrestling with you for your salvation. Let me open my eye. Someone else come. Then I finish the prayer. Someone else come. Father, I want to hear you say, well done. I want to be baptized or rebaptized because I have drifted from my God. I have gone away from God. I've gone into the world and I know that. I want to come back seriously. I need to be rebaptized. Come. Dear God, I have to close the prayer. Don't close the door of mercy, please. Wrestle, wrestle, wrestle until that person tells you, leave me alone. Then you have no choice. But fight to save them, Father. Now, God, put a special gift of your spirit, the spirit of determination on those who answer the call. Give me the words to say to them, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, amen and amen. They, now...